My name is Laird Klingler. I'm a librarian with the uh, Cornish Historical Society. And uh, we're here at the uh, town office uh, for the exhibit that the society has mounted. Uh, and we're here to interview uh, Scott and Lee Baker. Uh, the date is uh, August 6, 2017. And uh, Billy Scharf will be doing the uh, filming. Um, before we begin with the interview, Scott, uh, uh, as a member of the select board, on behalf of the uh, Historical Society, I'd like to thank you for allowing us to mount this exhibit. You're, you're very welcome. It's uh, the building that you use over on School Street obviously isn't nearly big enough, so it was a great spot to be able to display things up here where people could see them more regularly. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. We always like to begin by asking uh, where and uh, uh, when you were born. Uh, Lee? I was born, um, we lived in Cornish, but my mother went to Windsor Hospital. I was born September 24th, 1949. Scott? Um, I was born in Windsor at the Windsor Hospital, probably one of the last, so I've been told, one of the last births to be had in Windsor um, because they stopped doing doing uh, childbirth and it was at the what is now the Stoughton House, is that right there yeah. right there on uh, Main Street, yeah. uh, 1961. Now um, let's let's begin by um, identifying the location you know of your childhood home. Lee? Tell us um, where it was. They, they refer to it now as Scrag City, or we've had conversations. We'll, we'll get to that change later. Yeah. But um, it's over, it was a, it, that time it was on Lang Road, um, on the very, what would it be, north edge of Cornish, um, right on, our, in fact, our property boundary was the Plainfield Town Line, um, by the covered bridge over there, and by what is now Peter Berlin's house in, the, in that area. It's the house before you enter the covered bridge. It is, correct. Okay. It, before you covered, go through the covered bridge, it's on the right hand side. Um, and once you cross the covered bridge, you go about 100 yards and you're in playing field there as well. Okay. We'd like to learn about uh, the history of the home and, and how uh, your family came here. Uh, Scott, uh, you, I know you have information about that. Well, our grandparents Bought, bought the house that we were just talking about uh, in 1929, uh, November of 29, not sure exactly the date, but uh, we're assuming it was right around, obviously, at the time of the Great Depression, of the fall of, of Wall Street. Uh, they came here, I'm assuming, because of uh, work. They, they moved over from Windsor. Obviously, they were looking for a house, uh, and that one was available. So that's how we ended up in Cornish. They, uh, they had moved down here previously from Pomfret area, Pomfret, Vermont area. And my, my, our grandfather was, was a tradesman. Uh, he worked in a metal shop, sheet metal shop that I'm early on in years. I'm not sure what he did previously before that. Um, I mean, further back, our great grandfather was a stagecoach driver. Um, came down from Canada. He was a logger, mill worker, and like I said, a stagecoach driver, teamster. Do you know anything about the history of the home or how long the home had been there? Or? The house was built in uh, 1798. Um, by the person by the name of Thrasher lived there. As I was told, it's, uh, they were an artist of some sort, but I'm, I'm never was completely clear on who it was and, or anything about it. Is that where the Thrasher Road comes from? Apparently, through? yes. Interesting. Um, anything you'd like to add on that? Or? Well, there was a lot of controversy over actually the date of the house. Mm -hmm. And my father always said it was, what, 1789? And yeah. I thought you said you saw it somewhere. Was it 1787 or something like that? Or? I don't know. The date that was always on the house that, that Dad had made the sign was 1798. So. 98, yeah. Well, tell us, I'd like to learn about your, uh, about your childhood growing up in that area. And, and uh, uh, Lee, I know that you have an interesting story about your, about your snow uh, 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 oh, oh, yeah. uh, sledding. I don't think there could have been a better place. Well, ta let, let's place us now. This is the time to talk about uh, sure. Land Road and where you sure. went, you know. You know, um, the story that we were talking about earlier on about the sliding and sledding and everything. Uh, we, my father had made a travis 
Um, it was always there as long as I can remember. So he used it as a kid as well. Um, we used to drag it all the way up to, to the top of the hill, which would be um, what used to be the day farm on top of the That's hill. That's what Pauline O'Neill's farm is now. Right. There was a house across the road from the barn there, and we used to drag it. There's a mile from Francis Perry's house, which was the next house down the hill um, on the corner of the road to Stuart Hodgman's house. Um, was a mile from our house. So we used to drag it all the way up there and it took us a good part of the day, just a bunch of little kids dragging this traverse up. And we'd get on it and we always tried to leave somebody at the four corners at the bottom, just above the house. Um, because cars, once in a while you'd see a car go by. Not very often, but we always want to make sure we, because it was a blind entrance. And we'd slide on that driveway all the way down through, through the four corners by my parents' house, through the covered bridge and up the hill on the other side until we ran out of energy. And how long do you, a distance do you think that? that it's, it's a little over a mile. Uh, it's about a mile and an eighth maybe or so. Yeah, now, we now, so, so we can place ourselves. That, at that time, Lang Road, was it's different from the Lang Road today. Correct. Um, the, the Lang Road used to run between Peter Berlin's house and Peter Berlin's barn. It came straight down the hill, right between the two buildings, down through to the four corners that still exist, and then straight through to the covered bridge, and that was Lang Road. Um, it's some time frame when I was, I believe, in the service maybe, um, Peter came in to own that piece of property, which used to always be the Rogers farm. I used to work for them in the summer and getting hay and whatever as a kid. Um, he determined apparently that he didn't like the cars going through right by his house, so he, which he owned the field behind his house anyway, he proposed that he move the road behind his house and down to its existing location today so that it, it wouldn't go by in front of the house anymore. Yeah. And um, apparently it was okay by the town and it was done. Because that was, was certainly done. understandable. With a farm, it, it was advantageous to have a road right next to a barn. Well, in the day, that barn had a, a milk can building that stuck out right to the edge of the road where they would collect the milk. A little different day. if you're living there as a residential home and exactly. cars are so, that's understandable. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that we used to go up there and slide just as much as we could because the town, they tried to do well on the roads, but we didn't have that much traffic in those days. I mean, Did you ever have any, any, any close uh, escapes with the cars coming or anything? No. Or, no, they worked out. We, 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 like I say, about the only time you had traffic on that road was... On Platt Road. On right. Platt Road right. and Lang Road, both, were somewhere between 6 and 7 in the morning and 3 to 5 in the afternoon when the working people would go to work and come back from Windsor area, Claremont area, or Lebanon area. But Scott, did you ever make that trip? Or no? I, I vaguely remember doing it only once. I was, I was yeah. pretty young and I do remember doing it just once. Wow. Well, Scott, tell us about your childhood growing up there. Well, my childhood growing up probably was a lot different from Lee's because there weren't any other children in the neighborhood. It was even even back in the uh, in the 60s and early 70s, the school population was still high, but my neighborhood didn't really have any other kids around. I think my closest classmate was almost a mile away, um, so I more or less entertained myself. I uh, learned at an early age that I liked to play with anything that mechanically inclined, so I, I liked to play out in the garage and, and I could fix and work on most anything. Uh, so that was probably where my mechanical life started was because I had to entertain myself and there wasn't really much of anything to do besides swim and entertain myself with, with whatever I, you know, I enjoyed. I mean, I, I mowed lawns for a lot of the people in the neighborhood. And once I got old enough to do that, and uh, like I said, there wasn't a lot going on. If you wanted to play ball or anything, it was pretty tough because, in a sense, I think our house may have been the furthest one away from the school. <coughs> so to get from our house to the ball field was nearly impossible when you had parents that both worked all day and whatever. It was it was tough to. Would you have gone to the central school then? I mean, 
the, the, yes, yes. what we call the, the grade school here now. Right. Yes, I, Before, after that was after the, the end of the one room schoolhouse. Yeah, I, I didn't uh, I didn't go to any of the one room schoolhouses. Did you leave? No, no. I missed it. Um, I was the second class into this school, so I just barely missed it. I remember going up to the Tracy School when I had friends that, that were going there. I'd walk up with them sometimes and go into the building mm -hmm. while. But I never attended a class there. Mm. My father attended all eight years there. At the Tracy School? Yes. Yeah. Eva Bernard was his, was his teacher, oh. and Eva Bernard was our principal here when I started up here. So Stuart Hodgman speaks of her. She, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. She yeah, taught Stuart too. Yeah. Now you were saying before, um, you know, behind you there would have been the brook, and that you could swim and fish. Mm -hmm. you know, in, we did. Yes. And also uh, uh, there was a grist mill yes. there. I thought it was a. I thought it was a lumber mill. But no, I, I'm, not sure, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Some people talk about a grist mill. Some people talk about. I'm not sure. Maybe it changed what it did over the time period. I don't know. Yeah. There weren't enough <coughs> remnant, remnants left of anything there to really get an idea of, of what. It but the foundation, you said, it's yeah. still there. It's yes. still there. Yeah. And there was a dam. The dam was gone. That was a wooden dam mm -hmm. uh, made out of logs, faced with boards, and um, there was a nice big uh, pool in front of it where they used to, the state of New Hampshire when they used to stock the brooks with trout, they used to put fish in there and us kids used to have a great time you know, fishing yeah. in the air. I want to ask you um, about, about Windsor when you were growing up, but tell us a little bit about Plainfield, uh, what, you, what you would have done in Plainfield, Scott? Uh, well, there, there wasn't a lot going on. We had a couple of general stores, uh, the church. I actually met my wife. She she uh, grew up in Plainfield, right across the, from the general store. And I used to ride my bike up, and uh, that's how I met my wife before I even had a driver's license. She lived in the uh, in the building, which is now the old village haunt, which is across from the general store. Uh, we used to go up to my gra our grandparents used to go up to church there all the time, and so did my parents. Uh, my my grandmother always walked. Because she didn't have a driver's license, so she, if she had, to, she wanted to go to church, she would just start out early. After my grandfather had passed away, she would she would walk up to church, and occasionally I remember my father going up and picking her up and bringing her home. But uh, I mean, the Plainfield's a fairly small village. Our grandmother belonged to the Mothers and Daughters Club. Oh yes, that was yes. Uh, that was up <clears throat> there, which is now the Historical Society in Plainfield. Lee, memories of Plainfield. Um, I remember both stores being very active, and then a little later on, um, uh, there was a small store, Stoney's Market, that opened over on Haywood Road. Um, he was mainly a butcher. Um, we used to take our cattle there and have them butchered and stuff like that. Um, but there were three active stores in Plainfield at that time. They used to have, once in a while, the kids would have a, a dance at the town hall. Um, of course, they were playing field kids, but because we, we lived so close to the line, a lot of my friends lived in playing field, even though we didn't go to school together. So they'd tell me, oh, there's a dance, you know, we'd walk up to the dance. And, mm. But uh, mm. there, it, was, it was a quiet, small community. Um, I don't really remember anything. Jenny Potatoes, there used to be a, a big... Well, where that storage unit is, is you by the um, auction hall and stuff. Of course, the auction hall was a school at that time. Um, then they built the new building there that's, um, that's not the school. Um, that next building, before you go up the hill out in the back, that was Cheney Potatoes. They used to do wholesale potatoes and other frozen foods, um, which was a pretty good sized business actually in that town. Uh, that would be, you know, you know where they. That's, I'm trying to place that again. There's a there was a school right there. Yeah, the, 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 on the as you're leaving town, one, right. there was the school, and then the, the newer school is yes. there now. The next house right there, just as you just before you go up the hill, right at the right. base of the hill, that was Bill Jenny's house, and that building out in back that that old the the yeah. They okay. Bill had a like say they went around they sold a lot of frozen stuff to restaurants and stuff potatoes and french fries and that type of thing. Now quite a contrast to uh, Windsor. <laughs> Windsor would, uh, I'd like to get your views on Windsor, you know, uh, you know, past and present, uh, Scott. 
Well, I remember Windsor being a very busy place. They, every store was open on Main Street. They used to have naps, lunch, and phase shoes, and the jewelry store, and men's clothing store. Was it Maxim's? Maxim's? Yeah. yeah. I don't remember there ever being a movie theater. Lee remembers the movie theater that was there, but uh, we had an auto parts store that had been around for years, which just recently closed a year or two ago, but it had been around for years. A couple of barber shops. Uh, drug store that used to be right on the corner of Main Street and State Street that's now an empty lot. That used to be a big three-story building at a Kelly's drug store in the bottom. Apartments above it. There's a florist shop. It was a very busy place and I can remember when uh, if you were in town when one of the shops like Cones or Goodyear was changing shifts they would have a police officer standing up on Main Street directing traffic. If you were on Main Street you waited for the parking lot to empty and that was just the way it was. Very Stuart busy. Hodgman has those same memories mm -hmm. of they had to have great policemen out to direct traffic. Yeah, they did that every day, change of shift. It was very busy. Lee? Yeah, as he was saying, Main Street used to be really busy with Polly's Posey Shop at the end. Um, then there was Harrington's Lunch. Um, there were three drug stores at one time. It was Kelly's Drug Store when it burned. The one that, I don't remember the name so of the, the one that was on. The Zonies on the other side on of the street. On the other side of the street, but there was one on the other corner where Windsor Automotive went for a while, right there on that corner. There used to be a drug store there. Cause they used to have a little three or four stool fountain. You could go in and get like um, shaved ice with you know lemon on it and stuff. I you know, little things like that. But they had three. I remember distinctly three barber shops. Um, Bob's barber shop, which we had to go to because he was part of our family. Um, but there were three. There was one down there on River Street, and then there was one right. Just the building is still standing behind Kelly's Drug Store. There was one there. Then there was one across the street on the corner. It was Jim's paint store where you could get all your painting and wallpaper supplies. And he, that was a part-time job. He worked full-time for Goodyear at night and he ran this, that store during the day. Um, there was this, um, Beeling's Hardware. Mm -hmm. um, now, do you remember the movie theaters? Oh yeah. I, I, I remember, I used to go to the one, I used to ride my bicycle to Windsor and go to the one that's on the corner by where the monument, where the military monument, it was there. Yeah, that one I remember very distinctly. That had a balcony and it had a regular. Um, that was there for a long period. That's where the uh, I think it's a Korean War soldier. Um, I'm not sure if it's Korean War or World War Two. But in a the, soldier. Yeah, one, one, so there was a theater yeah, right there. Right there on that corner. Yep. Yeah. But right beside of that, there was a, a, a business um, that our mailman had for a while, Macaulay. You know, Macaulay um, that sold furniture. My parents bought some piece of furniture that, that the they had, bedroom set, I guess, from them. Um, right next door to that was a little sliver of a store that was Bassoni's, and not Bassoni's, um, is that the fruit stand? Yes. Oblonis. Oblonis. Oblonis fruit stand. But that sold penny candy. As you went in the door on the right, they had a big, long table of, of penny candy, so you could buy penny candy and go to the movie theater. Do you, um, do you remember uh, any early movies that you saw? Most of the ones were those. The ones that I remember <coughs> seeing were the ones like um, the beach movies, you know, the Annette Fulicello and oh, those, oh, that, yeah. that <laughs> era, the ones okay. I remember yeah. going there to see. Yeah. Um, but like I say, then there was uh, the other, there was the Jewish mm -hmm. store in Abishan's Highway, it was right on Main Street before they moved out to the plaza, okay. Okay. Um, where the bank is, where where Mascoma is, there was a beauty shop in there, yeah. another barber shop. Actually, there was a little small barber shop in the back, there was four barber shops. What is it like for you today to go to Windsor? I, I drive down the street and just, and just do a remembrance thing. Do I, I mean, it's. No one else seems to be all that interested. <laughs> My wife definitely is, and every time I bring up a subject like that, she says, just leave it alone. But, um, you know, it was, it was great because. Like I say, I worked for Cone Blanchard in Windsor, but um, Goodyear and, and Cone Blanchard, you know, between the two of them, it was 2,000 employees. I mean, and it, it kept the area busy, kept the town busy, they had gas stations. They had 
One, two, three, you used four, to have car, several car dealerships in town. Five, for at least five gas stations in town, and they had the Ford garage that my father worked at early on in his career. He was the service manager for the Ford garage. Um, then they had the Chevrolet garage, and then they had, we think, a Nash yeah. dealership um, down the back. But like I say, it was a busy, busy community. I mean, it was Scott, a lot, do you have the same feel? Can you go back in time when you? Yeah, I, I can remember where the, uh, is it the Chittenden Bank now? That's Sandy Market. Yeah, that was. That gas was, there used to be a shell, shell gas station there. Yeah. Uh, I remember that before when the bank, the Vermont National Bank, was still in mm -hmm. in the uh, the other building. And apparently the Davis Brothers Garage, was out the back. Chevy yeah. dealership started right there, right there in behind the shell station before it moved down on the northern end of town. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'd like to, uh, now to, uh, you had mentioned this just in passing, uh, Scott, but uh, to ask how, how you met your wives and uh, tell us about your children. Uh, well, Scott, continue. Okay. Uh, like I said earlier, I met my wife, Michelle. She lived in the village of Plainfield, and I met while I was, I don't know, 15 or so. Um, and we eventually got married, and we moved into what we're going to call the apartment upstairs in my parents' house, which is kind of a long story because like the, my grandparents bought the house in 29 and, and they made provisions in there for family members in a separate building. You know, it's, it's like today's theory of a mother-in-law's apartment uh, where family members could always stay if they needed to. And we always had great aunts and uncles that lived up there and whoever needed a place to stay could come and stay there. And when my wife and I first got married, we, we stayed up there in that apartment until we could afford to buy our own house. And we stayed there for six years and bought our first house up on Root Hill. Um, lived there for almost 10 years. Had, we have two daughters. Uh, two daughters? Two daughters. Our oldest is Kelly and our youngest is Carly. Um, Do they reside in the here? Our oldest one is in the process of uh, moving. She lives in Heartland with her boyfriend. Um, she's 27, I believe, and our youngest is 18, and she's in a, about to move off to college. So we're about to start having the empty nest thing. Oh, wow. uh, so it's going to be a new adventure for us, not having both of our girls in the house at the same time. So, Lee, um, I met my wife through a friend, um, Nate Gass's wife, actually, Sherry, um, and, her, and my wife had worked, my wife moved up here from Florida. She had lived in Claremont and then moved to Florida and then came back and um, she was with Sherry, who was a close friend, friend, not a girlfriend, but just a close friend back in the days. Her brother and I used to chum around together. I met her and we just kind of, everything went well and um, I ended up going in the service and then I came home on leave and got married in 1970. Um, then I went off to Vietnam a week later. Uh, but anyway, that's another part of the story. But um, we have a daughter, um, Jamie, that uh, lives in Wethersfield. She looked hard in Cornish trying to find something that they could afford that was something that, that would be some they could fix up to be something and at the time we weren't able to find anything in, in Cornish so they opted to move over to Weathersfield. We have a very very nice home in Weathersfield. I have one granddaughter. Um, Georgia, is Georgia, that Georgia? Georgia. That's yeah. Georgia. Okay. Um, and um, my daughter supposedly was the first girl born in the Baker family in 150 years. But we found out it wasn't quite, it might have been close to 100, but it wasn't 150 because uh, my great grandfather that came from Canada, we thought he was an only child. And my grandfather, Baker, was an only child, and my father was an only child, and there's three of us boys. Um, so we figured that, you know, there's always been boys in the Baker side of the family. Well, come find out when my great grandfather was passing away, that he had family come down from Canada, and it was like two brothers and a sister. Hmm. So, 
But anyway, my daughter was the first one for good, several good. generations. Let's move now uh, to your careers. Um, Scott, tell us about your, your working career. Well, like I said earlier, I, I had to entertain myself with, with whatever I could find to do when I was, when I was younger. Uh, and I found a niche with anything mechanical. And it just morphed into being a, a diesel mechanic in the end. I mean, I started out working on cars like most everybody does and lawnmowers. Anything easy ended up being a diesel truck mechanic. Uh, for a couple of different places. I've been doing that for most of the majority of my life, uh, my working career anyway. Where do you work now? I work for Reed Truck Services. Uh, it was in Claremont. Uh, it's now in just over the line in Newport on uh, John Stark Highway. Lee? You know, uh, before you begin your career, you know, you were in Vietnam. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, tell, if, do you mind saying anything about Vietnam or your experience mm -hmm. there? So, I was there in 1771, so it was kind of in the winding down stage. Um, I was a helicopter mechanic when I first got there. I worked on Chinook helicopters, the big dual rotor helicopters. Um, after being there for a while, I decided I'd like to fly more, so I volunteered for the flight platoon and ended up being a crew chief on a, on a helicopter the whole time I was there. Um, had some interesting experiences, but nothing... So you, you were flying the helicopter? Not flying. But you were in the crew. I was crew. Crew in the helicopter. What we did is we, we mm -hmm. determined the loads, you know, the placement of the loads in the helicopter, determined what we were picking up with the hook to, to move and stuff like that. Yeah, we were. Did you the see helicopter combat? was basically the helicopter was mine. The helicopter was mine on the ground. Yeah. Um, I, they had to take and get permission from me when they came to the aircraft to fly it. Um, it was the way the military worked at that time. I was in charge of the logbook and the flight book and everything else. So. Did you see combat? Oh yes. Yeah. 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 Any, any uh, close calls for you? Or? Well, mm, closer than I would like. <laughs> It was part of an interesting story about that because we'd gotten um, hit pretty hard one night and we, were taking, we took a few pictures the next day after everything was all over with and I never gave it much thought. I had my film, everybody carried those extra little film containers on their camera uh, strap. And about three weeks later, four weeks later, I went to Hawaii on R&R &R to meet my wife. Well. She, she says, do you have any film? They have a place downstairs that develop film. If you have any film you want to get developed. I said, well, yeah. I just peel it out and, and hand them to her and she got them developed. And she came back, they came back like a couple of days later and she came upstairs all in white faced and everything else. And, and she said, you told me you weren't in any of those places. And of course, all the entire hooches were blown up and everything. <laughs> I mean, it was kind of a nasty mess, you know, helicopters scattered all pieces everywhere. And uh, so I, my, my story of that I kept telling her about, oh, no, we're, you know, we're in a really perfectly safe place, all went right out the window, and she got a chance to see the pictures before I did. Excellent. You know, I'm sure you are aware that Vietnam was not a totally popular war. Uh, Very You know, there were, were protests at home. Um, as a serviceman uh, being in Vietnam, uh, how did you react to that? I just tried to, to separate myself from that and, and what I, I believe that I was there doing something for the American people. Um, I didn't let the people, maybe because it, we, it was kind of a different kind of class arrangement between them and myself. I came from a working class family. Most of them, I always felt came from a wealthier family because they had time enough to be out there protesting. And if I was home, I'd have to be working. I wouldn't have had the opportunity to be a protester. Mm -hmm. So I just always felt that, you know, there was just a bunch that... Sort of a class difference? That, yeah, yeah, that I, you know, it didn't matter to me. It wasn't important to me. What was important to me is what I thought was I was doing the right thing at the time. You know, I asked you first about Vietnam, but tell us about your career, working um, career. I started, when I graduated from high school, um, I was one of five people in my class that were chosen to be able to go to work for General Electric in Burlington, Vermont, um, as a machinist. I went up there and I ran a boring mill for, for them. We made the miniguns for the helicopters in Vietnam. Um, 
after, after I kind of figured out I really didn't want to be a machinist all my life, I, I got done there and I came back to Windsor and got a job at Con Blanchard, which is another, or it was Con, Con Automatic then. Um, got a job for them, which is another machine shop, but it was close to home, close to friends, and that didn't last very long either. And I said, no, I really don't want to be a machinist. So I went to work skiing for a living. <laughs> two, two years, I full-time ski patrol in the wintertime. In the summertime, I worked on the lifts and mowed the trails and did that kind of stuff. Where was that? Mountain Scott. Mountain Scott. Had a great time. Didn't make any money, but had a good time. Whole um, the whole family ended yeah. up working there, except for myself. Yeah. And it was my wintertime playground. I, I absolutely loved when the winter came because I knew I was going to get to be there every weekend and every holiday. And, it was probably very busy. Uh, very busy. I was very, very busy. busy. Yeah. And I was kind of was very busy at the time. Yeah. And then I went into the military from there um, in '69, and in three years I came back um, to Mount Scotney. I was in charge of all the buildings and maintenance of the buildings when I came back. That was my the position I was given when I came back. Um, my father-in-law in Florida decided that he thought I should be, my wife and I should be down on stepfather-in-law, decided we should be in Florida. So he offered me a job down there. So my wife and I moved to Florida for six months, yeah. seven months. It wasn't very long. Didn't take long to figure out that really wasn't the environment that I really wanted to be in. Too hot for you down there? No, that busy. It wasn't the country. I mean, I grew up, you know, with a, a lot of room around and down there it was so busy and everything was going on so we came back up here and I went to work for Collins of which is where I stayed during a, a short period of time I worked for a dingy machine in the flat. Oh, did you? Yeah. We had some financial problems over there and they went bankrupt uh, in the period between them going bankrupt and getting back on their feet with a new owner. I worked for Barry over here with Dave. Um, that's where Dave and I had our conversation that we were talking about earlier. And um, that would be Wood. Yes, yes Dave Wood. Yes, right. Yeah. Uh, very, very nice guy, gentleman. Yeah. Um, and I stayed right there, basically, other than being under four different ownerships. Um, stayed right there in Dick on Blanchard until uh, I retired. I see. Let's move now to your um, your volunteer activities in Cornish. Scott, starting with you, and now you're on the. Uh, uh, on the select board, uh, uh, well t tell us about uh, your time on the select board, and you know. Um well, being on the select board was something that I had thought about for for a long time. I I had been kind of watching to see who was on, and you know how they were doing, and what kind of decisions that they had to make, and just kind of keeping an eye on on town business and such, so that I knew, because I really had a feeling that someday, when the time was right, that I was going to run for select board. Uh, and the time finally my my home life and personal life wasn't quite as busy as it once was so i decided to run i'm now in my second term but i've also been on the heavy equipment committee which is an advisory committee to helps helps the highway department mostly to purchase uh, equipment when it's time i've been on that i've uh, been on the zoning board for a short time and now being that I'm on the select board, I'm also the representative on the planning board for the select board. I've never been on the fire department. I did for a very short time uh, work for the police department back uh, was in the early 80s, I think, when Joe Osgood was the police chief. He was looking for, for people to help fill up the police department. And it was, it was at the time when, if you were a part-time policeman, you could take a weekend course to become a part-time police officer. And I found out after doing that for a short time that that really wasn't something I was interested in, so I didn't pursue it any further. But uh, that's about the end of my volunteering. Other, other than um, I volunteered for up at the school when, when our girls were in the ski program, which, which has been in existence for since I was in the fourth grade or so. So when both our daughters were in the ski program, I volunteered and, and chaperoned for that for basically 18 years of volunteering for that. Now on the select board, you know, isn't the highway department under your jurisdiction or, 
It, aren't, aren't you the main person? On it is. The, yes. the, the yeah. select board oversees the highway department mm -hmm. now because the, uh, the road agent is now a hired position instead of an elected position. Uh, before, when it was an elected position, uh, the, the road agent basically ran the highway department. He, he had to answer to the voters, and now he has to uh, more or less answer to the select board. So we have a little more jurisdiction over, over what happens with the highway. Maybe a little more stability, too, in the position. Well, that was the theory. Hopefully it's working out that way. Uh, mm -hmm. It's still, it's only been about three years of the uh, select board overseeing it as tightly as it is. So we're still all kind of in the learning learning curve. Yeah. Well, um, I'm sure being on the board takes a lot of time. It yeah. does. Yeah. Two, two afternoons a week, uh, plus if there's a planning board meeting, that, that one more evening of the week. So it's, you get a lot of phone calls? Do people complain to you? Okay, occasionally I'll get people to call me at home and <laughs> scream at me a little bit, but right. uh, for the most part they calm down after we talk for a few minutes. Sure, sure. Yeah. Lee, uh, tell us about your, your volunteer activities in the Basically, volunteer fire department. <coughs> volunteer fire volunteer department. Fire. Um, somewhere around 26 or 27 years of mm -hmm. that. Um, one term on the planning board. Um, and other than that, it's pretty much... Who were some of your chiefs at the fire department? Dwayne Allen. Dwayne Allen. Was, was the first chief, who was actually the second chief for town. Um, Dwayne was my f the first chief that when I went on. Um, John Ram. John. Very, very good chief. Um, Mike Manette. Was he young? Mike Manette. Yeah, Mike was chief for a while. Nate. And then Nate. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. You know, um, I'd, I'd like to move now to, um, we talk about uh, Cornish um, uh, past and present. Um, what, what are the major changes in your mind, and I want to focus on two that people have brought up in past interviews. Um, one would be the great improvement in the roads, that if you live upland or you know, dirt roads, the roads are so much better now. And uh, the other, of course, is the, uh, the decline in school enrollment here. Um, talk, let's start with the roads. You know, some of your, do you have early memories of some road problems that, uh, in Cornish that you remember? Or, uh... Well, I can remember, obviously, when Lee talks about sliding from, from up on top of Day's Hill. Uh, you wouldn't be able to do that now because they sand the roads pretty quickly after they're plowed. But I can remember, as a child, waiting sometimes two days after the storm was over before they would come by and plow the roads and you may never see any sand. So it was, it's changed a lot in that respect. And I don't believe that the mud is nearly as deep as it used to be, but that has a lot to depend on, on how the winter is anyway. It's not necessarily road maintenance, it's just however the winter happens to fall, whether there's a lot of snow or not a lot of snow. It's, it's very unpredictable as far as the mud season goes. I, back in the day, like he said, sometimes it'd be a couple of days before they'd plow. Um, I always seemed like the school buses could make it though. I don't yeah. know, I never could quite understand yeah. how that You ever had out. days off from school? Very not fair. very many, yeah. no, not like it is today. Um, but back to the sanding part, I remember them coming by and there'd be two guys in the back body of the truck with shovels. They'd fill up the truck with sand and then they'd go and they only did the places that required sand. I mean, like to get around the corner to get started up a hill, like Stuart brought it up the other day. Lang Road, to get up Lang Road, people would come right down by our house and back into the covered bridge and take off from there and go like a song right up through that intersection, that, that four-way intersection, to get up the hill. Because they have to get a running start on it and if they were coming up Platte Road, and trying to make that corner, they couldn't get any kind of a start. So they, they'd sand like a little bit of that, you know, I mean, little places. They didn't sand the whole road. They just sanded you know, the areas that you needed traction to get up hills and stuff like that. But they used to sand with shovels out of the back of the truck. The cars in those days uh, all have chains? A lot of them did. Always had winter tires, not, not didn't even have anything that they would call an all-season tire then. It was, it was, you put your winter tires on in the fall so that you could get around in the snow. I don't remember Dad ever having chains in the car, but 
he plowed driveways. They, they he always on, had chains yeah, when he plowed, plowed on, driveways. They hung on the wall there, on the, oh, on the yeah. lath there mm -hmm. in the garage. Mm -hmm. I remember that. And we had a Jeep, we had an old 1946 Jeep that my father converted over or into a plow, right? he'd made a plow for and everything else. And um, we put chains on that once in a while to plow with because it, it, mm -hmm. we used to get snow back in the day. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with where we used to live, but it, it, it had a horseshoe driveway. They came in on one side of the round up by the house and then back out. And I can remember winters when he'd have to fill one whole driveway right up full of snow because he didn't have any place to push it anymore. I mean, I can remember like 30 inches, three feet of snow yeah. after the lockdown. Do you remember more snow than we got today? Oh, yeah. yeah. Lots, a lot more. Lot more snow. Maybe it was just because I was shorter, but it seemed like we definitely had <laughs> a lot more snow. Okay. Yeah. And let's move to the. Um, the school situation, uh, declining enrollment in the school. Um, people have expressed different views, you know, on this. Why do you why do you think this has happened? Why has the uh, the, the enrollment declined in the school, Scott? Well, uh, it has a lot to do, I think, with two a couple of different things. One is obviously that no one is building any new houses in town, uh, and there aren't any young couples moving in, and it's mostly, I think, because the older population is still here. They like it so well that they don't want to leave, um, and then, you know, they just know they don't have any children. Their children have already been, either been through the school system or when they moved to town originally, they didn't have any children because they were already grown and out of the house. I mean, we have a lot of older people that live in town, and it's it's tough, almost impossible for the younger younger kids to be able to move in because there is nothing really available, and what is available is is typically expensive, more expensive than a working class family, young family can afford to buy. Mm. Right. I think, like, there were 31 or two kids in my first grade class. Um, but back in the day, when I was in first grade, families were larger. I mean, like the Perrys, mm -hmm. there were what, six, mm -hmm. six kids there, and the Aidens, there were four of them. I mean, Today, a lot of people only have like one or two children. And back in those days, it was nothing to have six or seven children. So I mean, that in itself, you know, puts more kids into the school system. If every family has them a couple of years apart, then you're gonna have five or six in the school system at the same time. Um, I agree with Scott as far as the pricing and stuff on properties and stuff. It's, it's up there pretty good for just a working class, you know, family. I mean, they've got to have pretty good jobs. You know, you something. think. You don't find anything for $200,000 anymore. You know, I, when I built my house, total cost invested at the time of completion was like 50000 I mean, you know, with land and everything else. So, I mean, that's uh, the pricing for your annual income versus the, the, what you're getting, I think has changed. The proportion is different. Today. You know, one thing that has come up in the interviews um, is that some people have expressed the view that there is a conflict between our land policies in Cornish and um, the desire to have more students. For example, it, it comes up with, with five acre zoning. Um, are we limiting the ability of young people to move into town through a five-acre zoning? Mm -hmm. um, now, Lee, you expressed that you told me one time there's a little bit of a history that you remember in terms of the adoption of the five-acre zoning. Well, you know, I wasn't involved in it, but I remember being in the background and of some conversations that were going on about. Don't forget, now the more people come to town, the more children we're going to have in the school system. You know, the more it's going to cost us to, for the school and everything else, you know, it was like a fear factor that was going on at that time. Did that have correspond with the development of the interstates? People, more people coming to the area? No, see, I don't remember the interstate making a huge difference here in Cornish. It mm -hmm. did in some of the other, um, Brownsville, like with a skier. It, it brought in a lot of Connecticut people. I remember being there as an employee. Mm -hmm and they were buying properties and stuff and moving up from Connecticut. But I, I truly don't really remember the in-state making a huge difference. Yeah. In we continue with what you're saying well, before I, about... You've got to remember, where I lived on the other yeah. side of town, they were only seasonal people anyway. Mm -hmm. 
you know, that town went, well, I mean, our area over there went from, you know, maybe 100 or 150 people there in that little community area over there, down to like 25 or 30 in the, in, in the winter time. But continue with what you were saying before, that, that you remember the five acre zoning being considered in relation to limiting people. Correct. That's that's the part of that conversation. Like I say, I was involved in the conversation. I don't remember if I was too young to be involved in it, and, but I was listening to what was going on. That that was going to help limit the amount of people who would be able to come to the town because the five acre zoning was going to be expensive for a lot of people to even be able to buy a five acre lot, you know, or, or versus a one acre lot. But um, that was. But I remember from being on the outside listening, listening and yeah. was that that was what they were trying yeah. was one of the things that was going to try to help make a difference. But you also got to remember, we used to have conservation property. We used to have a lot of different things. We used to have size of square feet, how many square feet your building could be to be built within certain areas of the town. Because when I was built up on Dalton Hill, my house almost didn't comply with the square footage because it was limited up there in a way that was, how do I want to put this, um, they were trying not to have manufactured homes in the area. So to do that, you do it by square feet. And I remember when I had to go to the planning board, no, I'm sorry, I had to go to the zoning board of adjustment because I my property was in um, conservation area. It wasn't rural residential. So you had to get a, a, a variance to be able to build in that piece on that property. And things changed. I mean, that, that whole thing has changed since I built my house. But um, they asked me how many square feet it was going to be. And I remember Polly Manette was on the board. And Polly said, I don't know if that's large enough to fit into that size of those houses that you have to, you have to comply to be or not. And then I explained to her that it was the way it was laid out. She asked me for the width, and I told her the width. And she said, I don't know if that's why, but mine's built like two L's backed up to each other. That's an L and an L. So, I mean, but anyway, it doesn't matter. It was like they were trying to limit the growth of the town in a quiet way. They didn't want to come out and say it. Yeah. They just wanted to try to. Scott, do you have views on this? Or? I do somewhat. I, I the five acre zoning I think is is okay. It's in my opinion the, the conservation easements that have been put on recently or in the last fifteen or so years. That that I mean I, I love the fact that we have a lot of open land in town, but as soon as you put a conservation easement on, you you never ever will be able to build a house or use it for anything other than enjoying. It as it is, um, it, it would be it would be fine. It just seems like it's it's gotten out of control. It, it's as soon as a landowner decides they want to put their their land in in the conservation easement, there's there's no regulation that says that they can't. Uh, as soon as they make the arrangements, it, it it's all done. Property tax laws, right? Yeah. Difficult uh, issues that, uh, you know, I, when I do these interviews, I'm not advocating a position, but some people have said that we can preserve open space and also have more clustered housing, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps even on an acre, right. you know, on that. Right. Views on that, Scott? Or, uh, well, I certainly don't mind the, the fact, like I spoke about earlier, about the mother-in-law's cottage or mother-in-law's apartment. I mean, those are very... It's, it, there's a lot of come and go with, with that arrangement, and I think that's a great great idea. That way it keeps, if, if families want to be able to stick together and, and have their older older parents live with them or their, or their children, for that matter, mm -hmm. be able to, to stay and give, you know, give them a head start, uh, I think that part works very nice. I mean, you can have two, two dwellings on one piece of property. Uh, I, I very much agree with that. Another uh, issue that has come up um, relates to current use. Um, Steve Taylor, among many people I've talked to, has said that the current use represents a, a transfer of, of tax, tax money. Um, 
He was on, on current use, Lee. As I talked to you a little bit earlier about that, I'm, I feel it's kind of almost an unfair tax break because um, it, it puts all the burden onto the people with four or five, six acres of, of land because they pay the full freight where when you go into current use, the only thing you do is the one acre or whatever the buildings encompasses and you get a big break on the remainder of the property depending on the type of current use you use. And in some cases, people pay more on a four acre piece of land with their house, much less house than someone on a piece with a lot more land per, per acre problem cost. Um, there again, we're backing up to the, to the family farm thing. You know, that was a big deal about trying to save the family farm. And, um, I, I don't know. I, I, I have my mixed feelings about it. Um, not being ever able to afford to own that much land, so I never had to worry too much about putting any of it in current use. But I'm, a, I'm Scott. Yes, Lee, you, Lee and I are a little, little different here on this one because I actually own enough property to put some in current use, and it's not necessarily because I went shopping for it, and that's why I have it. It just came with the house that I, would, I could afford to buy at the time. You don't own parcel each other? I do, yes. yes. My, my house was, was a, a fixer-upper for sure when I bought it, and that was the only way I could afford to buy a piece in town, and I was just fortunate enough to be able to, to come across it. Uh, worked on it for a year and a half, almost two years before we could move in. And, but anyway, I, I have 29 and a half acres, so I have a fairly good sizable chunk that's in current use. And where Lee only has a three and a half or so, so he, he yeah he pays a, roughly about the same tax a year that I do, and I have almost thirty acres of land. And like I said earlier, it's not because I chose to have thirty acres; it just seemed to come with the house that I, I bought. Uh, if I had to pay full blown tax on that whole thirty acres, I, I probably wouldn't be able to afford to, to own it. This is, and, I, and I do very little with it. I mean, I, we cut a few trees now and then, but I mean, it's more or less just, it's wildlife. It, it, it's very close to the Korea property, so that it, so some, of the, some of the trails actually come up into the back corner of my property, or very close to it rather, but uh, I mean, it, it's more or less just, just open land, forested land. Yeah. Yeah. It does represent a transfer of tax. Mm -hmm. as, well, as this is what, this is where we, we, probably agree but disagree is that he's saying he couldn't afford to have that but if they did away with it completely everybody's tax would go down per acre mm -hmm. some would come up some would go down but it would level out and be a fair tax you tax on your dwelling and in that piece of land like everybody else is the land all becomes at least fixed and, and, the, and the other way you would have to look at it is is my, my 29 and a half acres is uh, more or less a useless piece of land. It never can be subdivided. It never can have more houses built on it. And it's because of the way it was deeded. And that was required by the town when, when the lots on my road were split up and subdivided. It was required from the town to have it written into the deed that that piece of property could never be subdivided or be used in any other way. So in theory, I mean, it's always going to be a current use piece of land because it never could be used for anything else. So it's more or less just a woodlot. Woodlot. Mm. Well, I think um, I've, I've covered the, uh, the questions that I wanted to and uh, uh, just, uh, I, I would say that I think this is somewhat unique. I don't think we'll ever have the opportunity again to interview two brothers that basically spent their whole lives, you know, here at Cornish, so I, I thank you, but um, is there anything else that you would like to add that we didn't cover, uh, Lee? Or? Well, adding on to what you just said, it's two brothers, but with almost a generation difference. Mm -hmm. There was 12, 12 years? 12 and, years difference between yeah. us, so the things that I grew up with and did, not by long shot the same stuff that he did because a lot of it was gone or things had changed by the time he he came through it so uh, it's kind of a unique thing. There, are, there are a couple of things i would like to touch on that i think we sure. may have forgotten about was the fact that i mean I, I started to talk a little bit about our grandparents and how they ended up here from pomfort 
Um, and my mother's side of the family, they started out in Barry, Vermont, and they moved into Windsor, primarily for the same reason, I think, because of the machine shops and such. Um, and our grandfather on my mother's side was, was a caretaker and a chauffeur, chauffeur over in Windsor. Um, our grandfather. But he worked, started out when he finally got home from World War I, working for National Army. National so he Army. came into a machine. And they, and they lived, and they lived in, the, in the National Acme Housing, which is Jarvis Street area, where that was all company housing. When they first moved to town, they lived there in company housing because he worked at National Acme, which now, was uh, in is the that, good is year. Is that the, comp, the, the apartments you see when you come across the bridge? No, 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 no you can see from this side of the river that are right now next to the river. Oh, oh okay. When you're at the boat landing, you look and you see those houses along oh, 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 that, on the bank. That's really, that was those were all Acme houses. Yeah, and they and they were so close together that you couldn't walk between them. They've torn a lot of them down, and I mean they didn't really have heat. They didn't have hardly any running water. They but, didn't have much of anything. It was just a shack for them to live in. And I mean they, they didn't stay there. They didn't stay there long. Well, um, they would have. They would have moved sooner, except my grandmother had always had a telephone, if you can believe this or not. Way up in Barry in East Orange, up in the woods of Vermont, her grandfather had run a phone line to the house because he wanted them to have a phone. So she would move out on 44 toward Brownsville out there until they had a telephone. <laughs> so yeah. it, that held them up for a while. But. And, I, and I said earlier that our great grandfather came down from Canada as, as, as a teamster. We had when we cleaned out our parents' house, there was always a sack that, hang, that hung up in the attic and we were always told that we weren't allowed to touch it. And even after my grandmother died, my father would never let any of us touch it. Well, we went up and cut it down after our parents had passed away and we were cleaning out the house. And it was a robe in there that our great-grandfather had used to cover up with when he was running the stagecoach, or at least we assumed that. And we always thought that it was made out of a buffalo skin. And as it turned out, we found out that it was made out of a Newfoundland, Newfoundland dog hide. And oh, really? yeah. the town that he came from up in Three Rivers, Quebec, they apparently bred and, and sold Newfoundland dogs. And as they got older, they used their hides and they made this, this robe. And anyway, we pulled it down out of there after and found out that that's what it was. And it was still in perfect condition. It had been hanging in a dry environment for, what, 60 or 70 well, years? 80 well, years? Uh, way beyond that. Do you still have it? No. No, actually. We sold it. That's another we story. Didn't, we didn't know what it really was, so we had somebody take a look at it, and he, he ended up buying it, because none of us wanted anything to do with the dogs again. You know, eventually coming from Quebec, um, you think of a French Canadian, but Baker is not a Canadian. Belanger. Belanger. Oh, so it's a ch name change? Yeah. So your parents were French Canadians? Only, only, only by someone telling us. We can't find any proof or anything else, but they say that my great grandfather, they came down, changed it from Belanger to Baker, which I guess is a direct translation to well, Baker. Belanger to Baker. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. And again, we, we touched on. The fact that Lee went to work at, at Mount Scotney Ski Area, and, and eventually all of our family worked there except myself. I was too young, but uh, it was it was a perfect playground to grow up in. I mean, like I I had a very quiet existence at home because there weren't any other kids around. But as soon as I got to go there in the fall and the winter, I had a whole different group of friends, and most of them I ended up eventually going to high school with because I went to Windsor High School and they. They were all Windsor, Brownsville people. So I more or less knew everybody in my class because I'd already been acquainted with them. Yeah. So that part of my childhood was much different. Yeah. That's a shame that uh, with the Estelle Resort having closed. Mm. It was so popular in the area, right? That was the place to go. It, 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 was, a, it was a family ski area. Yeah. Um, and they tried to make it into an, an attraction. You know, bringing they wanted to bring in more people from. They wanted it to be like a Killington or an Okemo, and it basically had always been just a family ski area. The locals skied there, and a few people from out of state. But you know, they just it just never was right for the growth that they were looking for. 
You know, you mentioned about uh, your family coming down, I mean, coming to uh, this part of the country, you know, for employment. Um, during the Depression, did, did, were your family, did you always have jobs? Um, were there always jobs in, in Windsor for you? Or, uh, I don't remember. My mother always talked about Col living Col up. Coles always ran, it never shut down. I know that, but it slimmed down, I'm sure. My mother always talked about growing up during the Depression, but they didn't realize that they were poor. They had their farm, they had food, yes, and yes. they always had animals. Yeah. They made their own clothes. They didn't realize they were poor because everybody else was too. Yeah. So it really was just a way of life. You know, they didn't know that they were supposed to have money or whatever because because they never did. But well, yeah, the impact, is, certainly you know, with the farm community. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I've heard that from other people too. I've asked how did how did the, 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 the depression impact you, and they said really not, mm -hmm. not a lot. It. You know. it passed down from my grandmother on my father's side, his mother, um, who owned the house here in Cornish, bought the house in Cornish. They, to, to, as long as I can remember, always lived with the mentality that they could happen again. Always save, 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 always, you know, don't buy anything if you can make something, mm -hmm. attitude. Um, it, it, Lingered in the family all the way up through to this to this one here. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? <laughs> not me. Not, not me. No, I'm, a, I, I'm yeah. sorry to say that I enjoy my my all I can. I'm sure Scott does as well. But, uh, anything else you want to add on that? Um, no, I don't think so. I think you're very knowledgeable about your family history. That's, that's Thank you. Good. Well, I, I love my history. Yeah. Good for you. Good for you. Okay. Well, I think I think we're finished then. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Very Thank you. Very Thank you. And I always like to say at the end to uh, Billy, uh, uh, Billy, that's a, a, a take. Thank you.